Well, it's not a chemical imbalance, and it may not all be in your head. Hi, I'm Scott Ott with Bill Whittle and Stephen Green. This episode of Right Angle brought to you by the members at BillWhittle.com. Gentlemen, I picked up a story, I believe, that uh, was kind of consolidated at TheFederalist.com um, about um, a depression remedy, according to a study from Ohio State University that got published in the Journal for Positive Psychology um, this month. And here it is. Doing nice things for others may actually help people with depression and anxiety feel better about themselves. Now, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And there's one other element here that kind of surprised me when I dug a little bit deeper. Um, and, and by the way, I do not pretend to be a doctor here or on TV. And so uh, please ignore anything that might sound like advice here and use your own best judgment. But... <laughs> What the study found was that they, they kind of used to think that the way to get out of depression was to get into social situations. So if you could get into, uh, you know, go to parties or go to places where friends are or go to Starbucks, as we found in, in another episode of Right Angle this week, <laughs> that's no longer uh, wanting to be a place like this. But you could go and hang out with people and that would make you feel better uh, about yourself. However, according to this study, and it's a relatively small scale study, but it seems well grounded. And, and I'm quoting here, it's not enough to just be around other people participating in social activities, according to the co-author of the dissertation that this study is based on. Um, there is something specific about performing acts of kindness, things that make other people feel happy or feel good. Um, and this comes on the heels of another study from a year or two ago uh, that was reported in Psychology Today that, um, that the, what we've been saying since about the 1980s, that depression is caused by a chemical imbalance in your brain. And frankly, this is why Prozac became one of the top selling drugs of all time, because it purports to remedy that chemical imbalance of serotonin in your brain. Um, According to several studies, there's not really any scientific basis for saying that that's the case. <laughs> um, and in fact, the, the studies have, uh, have concluded in many cases that you're just about as well off taking a placebo as you are taking anything that would try to rebalance the chemicals in your brain. Uh, 23 million Americans, by the way, teens and adults, um, experience depression and uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of economic impact from the cost of drugs to the cost of lost work time. It's a major suicide risk factor. And the story in the, in, that story was reported, I believe, in The Hill, or I'm sorry, Psychology Today, um, is that we do not know how the so-called antidepressant medications actually work, and they often don't. Um, so, Stephen Green, I find that this is a, an interesting combination of, of things. First of all, the idea that so-called settled science that we've all accepted since the 1980s and invested billions of dollars into funding through the drug industry has basically been upset by a mere analysis of the actual science. And these are typically, you know, they do studies of studies. They do a review. They pull oh, together yeah, a bunch the, of studies. The big meta-analysis stuff. Yes. Yeah. I find those yeah, fascinating, they, by the way. Yes, and they pull them all together, and, and that, that overcomes a basic flaw with the scientific method, which is not really a flaw with the method itself, but how we approach it is that people doing isolated studies all over the place kind of not really correlating with each other, and, they, and they're not you know, coordinating. They're just grabbing little data points, and so when you do these, one of these meta-studies and pull it all together, but Steve, I, I find it fascinating here that they, that they lampoon, first of all, and, and not in the funny sense, but they p basically pierce the idea that somehow if you could just adjust the serotonin in your mind, everybody would be, be okay. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and they don't know why when it does work. But more importantly, that if you get outside of your own concerns about what's going on in your own head and actually focus on someone else, and do something kind for that person to make them happy, it's better than a placebo. What do you think of that, Steve? Uh, well, first of all, I do enjoy my placebos. Uh, I find the balance comes not from the, the chemistry of my brain, but the balancing the, the things you put into your body. Uh, you really want to pair Valium with brandy, uh, Xanax with vodka, 
And uh, Scotch goes with any damn thing it wants to. And again, I'm not a medical doctor. This is not advice, and it's certainly unsound. So please don't listen to anything <laughs> I say about that. Uh, more seriously, though, this uh, this got me thinking about, uh, uh, of all people, my father-in-law, and not because he's depressed at all, but he's a he's a really interesting guy. As a Air Force veteran, a combat veteran from, uh, from Vietnam, and he uh, served uh, NATO bases in Europe for... Basically, the rest of his career, I, th- I think he did. Uh, I think after Vietnam, he came home in seventy one or seventy two. Between then and when my wife graduated high school in ninety one, he and his family lived in the United States for like three years out of out of those out of those twenty. So just all all over all over Europe. And when he retired from the Air Force, he started working for the Saudis, believe it or not. He was running a, an Air Force base for them uh, down on the Red Sea near the Yemen border. I forget the name of the province, but if you look it up, you go, oh, that one. Because 19 of the 20 hijackers came from Saudi Arabia on 9-11. 18 of the 19 came from this province. So it's just it's not, not the kind of place he wanted to go back to after the 9-11 attacks. And he didn't. He, he retired from, from working for the Saudi Air Force and began uh, working for a missile defense company in Colorado Springs. And he did that up until not quite a year ago, when at age 80, they finally said, look, dude, (laughs) it's time to retire. (laughs) You got to go. And this was working out um, maybe not so well on the home front because they've had this this marriage, my in-laws, this beautiful marriage for for decades and decades. But it was predicated originally on the idea that he would be TDY for weeks or months at a time, a couple of times a year. He just wouldn't be around. And then, of course, it was in the Saudis, he was uh, over overseas for, I think, 11 months out of 12 out of the year. Uh, and then he was working long hours for this missile defense firm. So suddenly he's at home all the time. And maybe maybe that just wasn't what they were used to at all. And within, I think, months of his retirement, if you want to call it that, he started volunteering at the local elementary school, uh, helping teach and tutor math. And he is, I have to tell you, he, th- this man has done a lifetime of service, whether it was, with, uh, whether it was uh, in Vietnam, whether it was in Europe, whether it was uh, helping the Saudis defend their country, or doing what I think is maybe the, some of the most important uh, national defense work you, you can do, missile defense, it's always been service. And now he's brought that to a very local, very personal level, helping elementary school kids learn math. And I got to tell you, at age 80, he may have slowed down a tiny little bit, but he is as sharp and as happy as, as any person has any right or expectation to be. And so, Scott, that is the guy I thought of when you mentioned this giant study. Bill Whittle, I think it's fascinating because there's been a uh, so-called, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, a so-called epidemic of loneliness across the country, mm-hmm. specifically regarding uh, people being shut in because of various restrictions related to the pandemic. And, you know, there's there's uh, kind of epidemic anxiety and uh, we hear about depression all the time. And this is a growing thing with the, with the rising generations here. Um, but the headline in the story that I saw this in that kind of referenced this but the suggestion here is the problem may not really be loneliness or even depression, but possibly, and they use the term, narcissism. And that's based on an old mythical story of a guy who just couldn't stop looking at himself, his reflection. And it's this idea, we, we use it as, as kind of a character flaw, but it's the idea of getting so absorbed in your own problems that um, that you can't get out of that. And and the way to break it is to look away from the mirror for a moment and find someone that you can do something kind for. Is that, is this sound crazy? Uh, No, it doesn't sound crazy. Um, I had some experience in this. Uh, So first of all, the the business about the, um, the medication, Uh, what, what you find when people have uh, either clinical depression or bipolar disorder, whatever the case may be, usually it seems like there's some kind of a brain imbalance that makes them 
commit behaviors that are not good for them. Those behaviors that are not good for them keep them in a constant state of stress and anxiety, which then feeds the thing. So it's it's both internal and external. It's both brain chemistry and behaviors. And the bad behaviors make your brain chemistry worse, and your brain chemistry makes your behaviors worse. And, and so you can intervene on the non-medical side of this and achieve some real results. That's essentially what the 12-step programs do. They are about um, modifying your behaviors with the assistance of other people, and they're all predicated on the idea of a higher power, which you don't have to call God if you don't want to, but most people do. And and to go to your idea about narcissism, the the, the first step of the 12-step program is to acknowledge that you're powerless over your drinking, your addiction, your eating, or whatever. Uh, and that and that you're powerless, meaning you need you need a higher power. That is designed to get you out of that self-reflective quality, right? One of the things, uh, I went to 12-step program for 18 months, and there are a bunch of aphorisms there that just never left me. And one of them was when you get defensive, you know, but well, I don't know. They would just look at you and say, well, man, if you've got it all together, what are you doing in this room with the rest of these drug addicts? <laughs> and and that's pretty much shut you down. But one of the things that they said that was most effective and one of the things I remembered most clearly was you can't be grateful and unhappy at the same time. Hmm. And I thought, yeah, that's really, that's really, really good. So the idea of, of doing things for other people makes you grateful and, and it, it gives you a chance to feel good about yourself when most of the time you don't feel very good about yourself. Uh, as far as the medication goes, I mean, I spent – four or five years, I would say at least, pretty much working on my behaviors on a daily basis. There was a time there where I was going to, uh, I certainly was going to a meeting every day, and in the holidays I was going three times a day. And um, and so there's that, and that is a difficult, difficult, difficult struggle. And the, the psychologist I was seeing at the time said, you know, Bill, it'd be great if there was a magic pill. This would be 85, 86. It'd be great if there was a magic pill that could just do this for you. But there isn't. You just have to do the work. So you get used to doing the work. Four or five years go by. I get a call from the same person. She says, remember when I told you there's no magic pill for this stuff? I said, yep. She said, there might be. And uh, I said, oh, really? She said, yeah. Uh, so uh, I, got, I got the first prescription for Prozac in 1993. I've pretty much been on it since then. Prozac takes a while to really come up to speed. It's it's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Basically, it's people with with emotional instability issues don't have a serotonin is a moderating uh, neurochemical. It, it tends to moderate emotions. So people think that people who are depressed or or whatever they think that you know they'll come up to them and say, well, why are you feeling so bad? You know, everything's going well for you. You know, why don't you just cheer up? It's like, you know, that thought had occurred to me. <laughs> the thought had occurred to me. Uh, and 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 so what the serotonin does, so, so somebody with, with low serotonin, and I was a couple quarts low for most of my teen years and into my 20s, what it means is that you still experience emotional reactions to stimuli. It, it's just, it knocks you much further off off of where you should be. Little things knock you a long way, you know? And and so while it takes a while for that to kick in, I, I remember I took, a, the first dose I ever took of Prozac was in the morning. And when I woke up the next day, the next day, my first thought on opening my eyes was, oh, so this is what normal people feel wow. like. I just instantly, wow. you know, instantly. Um, so none of this is the solution. Really, if you if you're depending completely on the medication, you're gonna be missing the work that you need to do on the behaviors that you develop because of because of the, the chemical issues. If you if you're working just on the behaviors, you've got chemical issues that are never gonna go away. If for people to suddenly say that this drug is is you know maybe a placebo or not really working all that well, now there's an awful lot of testimony. You said it's one of the best selling drugs in history. It's, it's a lot of people to fool, you know. Um, so. But to the to the main point about what you're saying, the, the the gratitude and the getting outside of your own experience when you help others, you are on some level. Just the fact that you are helping them on some level, there's a person who is in greater need than you are, at least in this one particular area, right? Otherwise, they'd be helping you. And I think a lot of it goes to um, 
it's not like you take pleasure in seeing people who are worse off than you are, but you do take pleasure from being able to help people when you basically spent your entire life asking other people for help. And, and I think that experience uh, explains an awful, awful lot of the uh, effects that they're talking about in the study. A number of years ago, my wife and I um, hosted a Bible study in our home, and at first it was just a couple of people. Actually, it was just me, my wife, and Steve. Not this Steve, another Steve. And, um, and then eventually Steve, after six months, managed to persuade his friend Mike to come, and Mike was having a drug problem. And, and then um, from time to time, I'd run into somebody outside the addiction treatment center downtown and uh, would invite them to come uh, to our home on Sunday nights. And after a while, uh, the Addiction Treatment Center put in its official policies that there were two kinds of outside activities you could go to on Sunday night. You could go to the AA meeting or you could go to Scott and Stephanie's house. Hmm. And those were the two approved external meetings. So we wound up at some point, I think at one point we had like 27 people in our living room, dining room, kind of slopping over into the kitchen. and. <laughs> Uh, just for a Bible study. And it was nothing sensational. It was just we were reading the Bible and explaining it, you know. So anyway, during that time, um, I met a guy uh, named Corey. He was sitting outside the Addiction Treatment Center. He was playing his guitar, and he was playing very well. Um, and he began coming to the uh, meeting at our house on Sunday night. And then eventually he got his wife to start coming, who was a lovely person, just one of the nicest people you've ever want to meet. And they became regulars. And so when, at least while he was in treatment, he was coming every week to our house. And one night, uh, when we were kind of talking about what's going on in our lives, uh, he said, you know, my counselor at the treatment center uh, told me that I have low self-esteem. And he, you know, talked about that for a little bit. And I said, I don't know what spurred me to say this, but I just said, you know, I am not a psychologist or a counselor, and I don't want to argue with anybody at the treatment center who I'm sure has a master's degree, um, but it seems to me in my contact with you, Corey, that you don't have low self-esteem, that you have high self-esteem. In fact, that all you ever think about is yourself, and think about what you've just said here tonight. Everything is my problem, and it's what people are doing to me, and it's the struggles that I'm having with this, and it's why somebody won't do that, and it's all circled around you. And I said, I don't, I don't think you have low self-esteem. I think you have high self-esteem. You have low God esteem, in essence. You think that you're the ultimate solution for your problems, but you're not. <laughs> And, uh, and that, believe it or not, was not received with a, with a return punch to my chin. Um, he, he agreed with me <laughs> and said, yeah, I think you're right. Um, and then it, it kind of caused me to flash back to other incidents throughout my life where I've had an opportunity and I, I do not go out of my way to help other people. I mean, I'm not some sort of, you know, constantly walking around trying to help people. But every once in a while, I stumble onto something that gives me a chance to do something nice for somebody else. And I can't think of a single instance over the course of my now too long life uh, where that happened and I didn't walk away from it thinking, wow, I'm so glad I did that. I got so much out of that. Yeah. You know, not not... I did so much for those people, but but I I felt like I sucked energy from them, <laughs> like like I became happier, I became better, you know, more even keeled. I had a sense of there, but for the grace of God go I, and a sense of humility that says, wow, you know, those people are just like me, really. I mean, there's no difference between that guy I just visited in jail and me, except that he got caught. And so, you know, it, it, it just, this study at Ohio State University that was reported on the, in the Journal of Positive Psychology really hit a nerve with me because I realized, you know, that is so true. Now, the question is, how do you turn that switch for somebody? How do you get somebody who is absorbed in their own problems and anxieties and their depression and, and suggest to them that maybe the answer isn't in here? <laughs> maybe it's out there. Or as they say, metaphorically, up there. <laughs> you know, maybe there, maybe there's something beyond you that is the solution to your problems. And maybe somebody watches this and sees this today and says, you know what? I'm going to keep an eye out for the chance to do something that I can help somebody else. 
and just give it, give it the experiment and see what happens. And I don't mean to suggest that we should challenge whatever pharmacological recipe you're currently imbibing, um, but that there might be something more to this life than you've experienced and that it's just outside your door. For Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, I'm Scott Odd. Thanks to the members at BillWhittle.com for making Right Angle possible.